Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, a regulatory landscape, and capital markets. This segment is presented by Charles Schwab. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site, we have David Tyree, Senior Advisor, Financial Crime Detection, Anti-Money Laundering at Validate Financial. He's also a retired U.S. Special Agent with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. Also joining us at Market Site, we have retired U.S. Army Colonel Brian Smith, Independent Consultant and Instructor for the Association of certified anti-money laundering specialists known as ACAMS. We're here to discuss AI's impact on anti-money laundering practices and closing the gap between banking, national security, and law enforcement professionals. It is great to have the both of you with us. Thank Welcome you. to Trade Talks. We're going to solve all the world's AFC problems right now. Sounds great. <laughs> David, I'm going to kick it off with you. Give us some brief background and, and your role at Validate Financial. Sure. Validate Financial is a platform that makes sense of money movement. And I've been there pursuing them before I was hired by them because I was doing financial crimes with the DEA and was overwhelmed by the amount of bank records that were coming in through various sources, trying to make sense of money movement so I could articulate that money movement to leadership within my agency for intelligence and to action that money, to seize money from criminal actors. So my role at Validate is to advocate for the platform to law enforcement, financial institutions, anybody that's looking at financial crime, this is what you need. Yeah, and Colonel Smith, if you could tell us about the work at ACAMS. Oh, great. You know, thank you, Joe. Appreciate having you on. Uh, yeah, after 29 years in the military as a financial professional, I decided to make the transition uh, to some uh, uh, consultancy and teaching. I've linked up with the ACAMS to provide teaching, education, and credentialing at the professional level for all of our government administration uh, agencies as well as other ACAMS clients worldwide out there. So I continue uh, to approach that uh, effort to bring the word to the masses. Yeah, and I would imagine the impact that AI is having is just astronomical in the anti-money laundering space. Oh, absolutely, financial information is, is large, it is diverse, and it takes different uh, forms out there. And with the introduction of cryptocurrency, blockchain, as well as just day-to-day -day financial technology as it morphs out there, the adaptability to ingesting and understanding that information is, is key to getting ahead of the criminals or trying to keep pace with the criminals because they're always one step ahead of us. Yeah, and it's evolving so rapidly. The technology is moving quicker than all of these agencies and, and policy can adapt to. Exactly, that's probably the number one problem right now is as we spoke speak about public-private partnership, mm -hmm. the data ingestion and how it's moving so quickly uh, we're siloed, right? So if you're in this country, we've got agencies that investigate different crimes. You have financial institutions that are looking at different alerts within their banks. What we need to do is bring everybody into the same room, understand through education and training and certification what the typologies are, use AI to identify those typologies, and then be able to communicate that outside of our silos to actually, as Colonel Smith says, turn wrenches, actually make action against this illegal money. Yeah, because you make a point in your notes here that law enforcement, national security, military, and so forth, they only know how to seize the money. But then what's next? Mm. So uh, you know, their perspective is the, 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 the shot of the money on the table at the bust. Mm -hmm. Or when the military uh, uh, takes down an operation, what's the money that's on the table? I, mean, I think my opinion, I think David would agree with me, is trying to bring the perspective and the education, understanding to those elements of what is in the range of possible, taking that financial information, the perspectives and understanding of the worldwide framework and the partner agencies that go with that mm -hmm. across the different silos of the government uh, to include uh, uh, law enforcement, military, national security. If you can bring that together, partner with academia and what is going on in private sector, you have a powerful opportunity to uh, uh, get one up on the bad actors when it comes to uh, illicit finance, counter threat finance, and anti-money laundering. Is part of the challenge when we talk about operating in silos, is it because of jurisdictions? Is mm -hmm. it because they're kind of doing the same job? Um, and not communicating that? What? I, lo I love the question. Part of it is, is probably some parochialism, but I think a large part of it, my observation is everybody, each of these agencies uh, uh, operates under a different authority, legal authority. Their capabilities are different. Even their mindsets are different. So whether the Drug Enforcement Administration, they do very great things 
uh, you know, going after drugs. The military does what it does. One of the blind spots, in my perspective, is that uh, we all need to understand the financial domain. We understand mm -hmm. law, uh, land, air, cyber, and sea domains, if you will, but this financial domain underpins every activity out there, friendly, foe, or illicit, and how do we bring that together? And if I can add to that, you asked a question about the cash on the table. Well, understanding the law and understanding that if an account is tied to and involved in money laundering, you can seize assets that, that have been acquired through that account. I've watched law enforcement take a, a dirty account and trace that money to homes, real property, boats, overseas activities. That's the idea, right? We have to take out the economic incentive to commit crime at every level, on the streets to the cartels. How we do that is to take away their toys, and I will, I will echo Brian, law enforcement is doing a great job doing it. Can we all do better? Absolutely, because the last thing I'll do is criticize. What I will do is empower and equip, and we, we're meaning making animals, Jill. So we have to be able to tell a story about the movement of money in a way, money's fungible, assets are fungible, the placement layering integration of a money laundering scheme are complex by design to throw off investigators. So we just have to be a little bit smarter than they are and it takes dedication, we talk about this all the time, communicating on the front end and in the culture of maybe law enforcement and military where we're so guarded and protected, maybe it's time to open up our arms, get with our financial institutions and collaborate on typology. What are you seeing in your community? What are you seeing where you work? and then sharing that information across the country to build out a network of crime fighters. Right, well, I mean, you did note though, speed is the new currency. Oh, yeah. You might not be able to identify these illicit rings, right? No. I mean, think about no. it from, um, you know, how money operates in today's cyber world. Sure. With digital assets as an example, although you can exploit any asset class at the end of the sure. day. A lot of times, these rings don't even know who's behind the screen, mm -hmm. and they could all be working in concert with each other. They probably are, and they may not even know it. Right. But at the end of the day, our job is to deter this, disrupt it, dis dismantle it through any means necessary. And what we spoke about earlier, study what's normal. We know what normal money movement on the blockchain looks like. Abnormal does jump out, and there's some great companies out there that will help financial institutions and law enforcement to identify, trace, and seize and recover those monies. About putting bad guys in jail, Absolutely, that is the number one priority. We need to take them out of society because they're corrupting a transparent economy. It takes all of us with a like mind that we can all agree this is wrong. The exploiting of people through addiction, human trafficking, elder abuse, you name it. These are all culturally wrong. Let's work collectively to address those problems and share information, like you said in the beginning, and collaborate with an objective of having measurable impact. Right, well, I mean, it also takes a whole government response, right? Mm -hmm. We understand what's happening with citizens, but when you think about our critical infrastructure mm. and national security and how that can be exploited, it takes on a whole other level where we can't operate in these silos. Mm -mm. I absolutely agree with your, your statement. Uh, and, and to piggyback off of, of your, your statement and David's statement, uh, this applies the financial underpinnings and the technology and the speed apply at the national security level to state actors, non-state actors, mm -hmm. terrorist organizations, as well as uh, other illicit actors that are out there. So we're talking efforts, understanding, and synchronization at the national strategic level, i.e. legislative and policy, at the operational level across our agencies, how do we implement bad guy, uh, law enforcement that takes care of bad guys, uh, national security takes care of national security, and then how do we bring those together with the private sector and academia, and then all the way down to the local sheriff's mm -hmm. departments, because when we talk about things like uh, cryptocurrency scams, pig butchering, and uh, the defrauding of our elders that we were talking about a little bit earlier out there, these hit at all levels, all the way from the corner block outside here all the way to the national competition and uh, 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 strategy level and between state actors. Right, so what's the pushback then? Because this all sounds logical to me, what you're saying. Uh, so one of my, my opinion is one part of it is a uh, lack of understanding of cryptocurrency, the blockchain, and I, I'm, not, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody, but uh, when I run classes, I'll ask, any, I'll ask the class, how many people can uh, explain blockchain or cryptocurrency to me. There's usually about one person who will mm -hmm. raise their hand. And so uh, if you're over about 30 years old, 
uh, and I'm, I'm making, because uh, I'm over 30, your understanding of cryptocurrency and blockchain maybe is not where the 20 year olds is. And so education and turning on the so what, getting the light bulb to pop on at our senior leader or elected official level to come up with the policy to drive that fusion and the capabilities to collaborate is critical. And we have, I think, work to do on that. Yeah. Yeah, if I can add to that, my experience has, being, has been that law enforcement understands money in and money out. We all understand how our own money moves. All money moves for a reason. You're not gonna have somebody in law enforcement who's opening up six LLCs with the BVI trying to obfuscate funds. So part of that is where it becomes overwhelming. I would love to see it as these investigations being a repeatable process like a DUI stop. And you know police around this country can do a DUI stop. Like it, they know the repeatable process. Also, all the way up to homicide investigation and a narcotics investigation. I've seen it all over the country, phenomenal. We need to take that repeatable process, apply it to financial crime, educate, equip, train these guys and women to get out there feel comfortable with it because again I'll tell you this show if we go into a house and we see narcotics or victims it's easy to leave the house with that evidence money is a little different because remember the police have money too so there's something cultural that we have to wrap our minds around what's illegal money what's legal money how do we prove it in a way that stands the test in front of a court in front of a judge and a jury this is why we did what we did this is what normal money looks like this is what abnormal money movement looks like. Here's how we proved it out through review of bank records, blockchain analysis. We have to prove our case to the point that the bad guys need to come up with something different, which probably will happen. Yeah, well, there's a couple things here. It's a matter of getting buy-in with the audiences that you're communicating mm -hmm. with, right? There's one way to speak to policymakers, academics, engineers, designers, the community, and so forth, because you certainly need community buy-in. The other challenge is, too, especially in the U.S., we're a very litigious society, mm -hmm. right? And to your point before, we have to be able to prove this mm -hmm. case, check all the boxes, dot all the I's, cross all the T's. And I think there's, there, there, that is incredibly challenging, especially when you're thinking about um, global cohesion sure. as well. Exactly. Because we all look at, at, at privacy and data sharing in fundamentally very different ways. And I'm sure that's part of the calculus where these challenges come in. Absolutely. Now, there are workarounds. Redact. There are great platforms that can redact information. If you're concerned about sharing PII, then there's ways around that. And I think we can't see those speed bumps as roadblocks because abs we know what we're doing right now isn't working. And that is not a critique. It's an observation. Right. And I sit with thought leadership and we have the same conversation. What if it was your data? Well, OK, take out my name, take out change, truncate my account number. Show me the money movement, and I'll make an informed decision before that money moves. We can use it for targeting. We can use it for counter threat financing. And we need to be proactive and not as responsive. That's just my professional opinion. It's a great point about being proactive and not responding. There's a big difference there. I mean, if we look at cybersecurity or data protection at a higher level, proactive, cyber first by design, making those investments, I mean, that's critical to all of this. I think, um, you know, the fact that we kind of wait and see versus designing and implementing from the get-go is uh, more of a technical challenge. I, I think the nature of law enforcement uh, and, and, the, and the public sector trying to keep up with the back, it's always a cat and mouse game. The cat being the illicit actors are always two or three steps ahead because they are innovating amongst themselves and adjusting to the framework that is out there. The bureaucracy of, of government regulation by nature moves a little slower. Uh, however, that does not mean that we should cease with educating, uh, updating, because the, dynam uh, the, the environment is so dynamic, the financial and the information dynamic is so uh, uh, fluid out there that uh, we almost, it's almost impossible to keep up, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, it's also public perception as well, right? When you think about law enforcement, when you think about military, what do we see in the media, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, big seizures of assets, right. and it's still, you know, boots on the ground when that environment has tremendously evolved over mm -hmm. the past 20 right. years. We're, what we're fighting is behind the scenes. You might not necessarily see anything outwardly, so I, right. I think it's just public perception of what law enforcement does. And what law enforcement does is solve problems, right? right? They solve them, they're trained to solve them quickly. So what Brian and I constantly are doing is bringing out this experiential learning model where we're taking law enforcement, training them to launder money, training them what you would have to do to actually take dirty money and run it through a financial institution onto the blockchain, from the blockchain to purchase real estate. 
why. There's an experience around that. Obviously, it's legal money that we're showing them, but mm -hmm. even, even downloading a wallet. These are things that most law enforcement aren't dabbling in because they're busy solving real crime on the street. So it's easy for us to come in and say, oh, and if you could just do giant financial cases, which by the way, they do. They do do okay. giant financial cases, but it, is it to the tune of the $10.1 billion in cocaine denied going to Europe this right. year by Jayad of South? Outstanding work. I want to know where that $10.1 billion was because we should be taking that. We take out the economic incentive for bad guys to commit crimes, maybe they find something else to do. May, yeah. May I piggyback on, of course. Uh, on that? So uh, we're all trained to do what we're trained to do. So, so a DEA agent goes after the drugs, the military goes after a military piece, so on and so forth. What uh, my perception is, is the financial understanding of this domain, and mm -hmm. I call it the financial domain for a reason, it has characteristics, it's got an environment, and how things move, how value moves, not money, how value moves. But we all get very little to, very little training on this to understand it. So when I see a stack of money on the table, aha, success, take the picture. Mm -hmm. But if I understand the framework, the potentials, the strengths, the opportunities of connecting the data, mm -hmm. connecting the data from the battlefield or from the drug bust, uh, all the way through to who is the, really the puppet master at the money laundering uh, piece and following that network all the way up. Now that it opens up a tremendous opportunity to go after the network. And if we can bring that together, that is, uh, uh, and provide a little more training, that is one of the things that I always stump for and support. Yeah, I mean, this might not be the best analogy, but it's almost like killing a roach, but not eradicating the entire problem mm. if you don't understand the source or where exactly. it's coming. Yep. Not that I'm comparing bugs to. No, that's a this great work, analogy to what I've done for 25 years. <laughs> I'm a cockroach. No, but you, you get my point. Yeah, if, if, there's exactly always more than the one. Disease. Right, there's always more than one. And if you can't identify that source, it's just going to continue to perpetuate itself. And I agree wholeheartedly. However, when we talk about cutting off the head of the snake, I also believe the rest of the body, the snake, leaves a mark. So we success leaves clues. What we can do corporately and collectively is, and what you mentioned is AI. You, can, you need a human loop, but you can take all of this data that we're talking about, use AI to ingest that with a human loop, and then turn that back out into the field and say, are we seeing this? Then go back with the human loop and make sure that what we're getting from AI aligns with the patterns, the typologies, et cetera. The, the key to this engagement is what we're doing right now. We're raising awareness, right. we're talking about it, and now we're saying there is a way to get here. And say what you about humanity, they always seem to find solution. Yeah, well, okay, well, let's wrap up and think about this. What is the benchmark for success? How do you know that these programs are successful? Is it a dollar amount um, or is it less of a dollar amount because you know that your priorities are, are being executed on. That's a really tricky question. <laughs> Trying to put a number on there, but I would say this is a nine inning baseball game and we are in the top of the second inning when it comes oh. to how do we get to success out there and the foundational piece of training, education, credentialing and adaptability across the agencies. Second step, bringing the agencies closer together to bring down the walls, the silos so that they're working together. So perhaps it is a interagency fusion cell at the federal uh, level. Uh, in, empowered by our very senior leaders. And then third is, how do you measure that out there? Uh, and maybe this interagency collaboration and successes out there. So I would be very hesitant to put a number on right. there, but I would put these conditions-based metrics as we go from top of the second inning to the bottom of the ninth with the bases loaded. All right, I appreciate both of your insights. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Joe Malandrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ.